I don't cry normally, but I do a lot of CR because the change is so evident in so many people, it's really overwhelming and it, it's re a reminder for me personally too of the change that happens in my own life, the change that happens in everybody's lives. You've seen up here on stage tonight, and some of you out there that weren't up on stage, you know too. And it is amazing to me, especially coming into Christmas, what we know what Christmas is really about. And we're singing songs about this baby named Jesus being born in Bethlehem and what is about to come in the next 30 some odd years while he's here on earth and what that means for us even today, thousands of years later. Also coming into the holidays, it's an easy time to, for some, to isolate and to fall back into some old habits and to numb emotions and to justify it. In fact, I've already had some conversations in the last couple of weeks and I've, I've warned us in about October coming into holidays, it, get, it gets a little thicker for some and it's tougher for some reason. It makes us more evident of our loneliness sometimes. Sometimes it can make us more aware of our past failures that we're still suffering the consequences from. Even if the Lord has changed our heart, you understand we're still suffering consequences for past mistakes. And sometimes at the holidays, that becomes more evident in our minds than ever. And so excuses start coming up. I can be a functional user and Jesus will still love me. And um, I don't even respond because it's a, it's a moot conversation in my mind. There's no other answer except for the Bible and Jesus. And the answers that we find in Celebrate Recovery for many that you saw up here are successful. It's successful for them because it's Christ-centered. And it's all about surrendering our will, surrendering your will, me surrendering my will, and saying yes to the Lord's will. Scotty, how's that go? Not my will. Your will. Your will. Not my will. Your will. Like militant style in my mind is becoming like, and it has to be like that. There's no other way. Jesus is really the only true way to grace and peace. In that order. Receive his grace, live in peace. So let's do a lesson tonight on denial. Denial is an important subject. Some in this room tonight may be in denial about something and maybe not even fully be conscious about it. Others may be. Denial is the very first lesson in a series of lessons in Celebrate Recovery because there's no sense trying any other step until you overcome the first step, which is coming out of denial. And so denial is an important subject to talk about, first and foremost, in recovery. We must come out of denial to get fixed. <laughs> Amen? Amen? All right. So this is based on principle one. And principle one says, realize I'm not God. I admit that I am powerless to control my tendency to, to do the wrong thing and that my life is unmanageable. And the verse that goes with that is Matthew 5, 3, part of the Beatitudes. Happy are those who know they are spiritually poor. Step one also goes with this principle. One of the 12 steps. We admitted we were powerless over our addictions and our compulsive behaviors, and that our lives had become unmanageable. I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. Romans 7 18. So tonight I'd like to talk more with, with you about this subject of denial. denial. Denial is, and it has to be, the very first step in our road to recovery. Principle one helps us realize that we are no better than anyone else. Arrogance is a contagious sickness in this world. And it's common to hear things like, you are your own God. You can do whatever you want. The world has a misleading way of trying to define this very short life on earth. Very short life here on earth. This is a drop in the ocean of eternity. Tell me if any of these sound familiar. It's a song. I did it my way. I did it my way. Who was that? Barbara. Frank Sinatra. What about this? I am the Lizard King. I can do anything. Yeah, Jim Morrison. And who, how many times have you heard this in society the last few years? Hey, you do me. You do I. You do you, I'll do me. You do you, I'll do me. Lots of them, yeah. 
for schnizzle. For schnizzle. <laughs> you know we're about the same age. <laughs> I just pictured his face, and now I feel really old. <laughs> For most black don't crack. <laughs> Have a quick look at social media and you'll see memes like these. I've got these slides up, John. I'm not sure. Yeah, we got them up. First one says, I refuse to go through life explaining myself and defending my decision to everyone. This is my life. I'm going to live it my way. No apologies, no regrets. Or what about this? Just a reminder, I belong to no one. I am owned by no one. I answer to no one. If I give you my time, it's your privilege, not my obligation. What about, I live for myself and answer to nobody? How about this one? Some don't need God to be good. Satan loves these phrases and attitudes. It's truly the way of his world. And the world bows to his ways and practices these practices these ways. That's why you can find the memes on social media. Jesus shows us a different way in his teachings. He calls us to walk in his ways and to do his will. Not our will. His will. Not our will. It's a way of humility, surrender, forgiveness, grace, selflessness, patience, love. And many of us have come to realize that these elements of character are much stronger than what the world will try to sell you. Pride, selfishness, lust, isolation, arrogance, hate, malice, gossip, slander, and blame never seem to go very far. These ways often lead to a person doing things his or her own way. In fact, these very things breed denial, and all these things lead to destruction. Let's talk about failures from the past. Who has failures from the past in their mind right now since I just said that? Yeah, me too. It hurts a little bit. It stings. <laughs> Hebrews 12, 1 says this. Since we have such a huge crowd of men of faith watching us from the grandstands, let us strip off anything that slows us down or holds us back, and especially those sins that wrap themselves so tightly around our feet and trip us up, and let us run with patience the particular race that God is set before us. Right. Who's in this huge crowd that verse talks about? I've always wondered that. And I chose this translation on purpose. It says, a crowd of men of faith watching us from the grandstands. My dad just passed away last January. I can't believe I'm already coming up to the year anniversary. It seems like a couple of months ago, it's still fresh in my mind. And he wasn't just my dad, he was my best friend. He was my spiritual mentor. There's no one else I'd want to go to before him. And then he passed away, and the man that I would go to after him was, my dad was his mentor, but he was my dad's age, and I've been around the world with him. And I went to him and I said, Jed, my dad's gone, now I need you as a mentor, let's start talking more often. And then Jed dropped dead of a heart attack a couple of months after that. And it's been a year for me, uh, and that's only a couple of examples of several friends I've lost close. Uh, this year and then those men go on I know where they are because of the faith I have and because of who I know they were and what was inside of them and so who are these men of faith watching from the grandstands can they see I wonder it doesn't say angels or God it says crowd of men of faith watching us from the grandstands anybody have praying grandparents that aren't here anymore who knows that their prayers are still working yeah. today? Yeah. We have no concept of time. So who's in this huge crowd? Who were these witnesses? You'll have to read Hebrews 11 to learn more about this. Hebrews 11, write that down if you'd like to in your notes. Something to think about tonight. This could be a whole other lesson on its own. I tell you, it's uh, very interesting. I'll tell you this is a hint. We are all going to live forever. No matter what you believe, no matter what you think is right, no matter what you think about life and death, all of us are going to live eternally, and I'll promise you that. We're going to live forever. So the question for each of us here individually is, where? 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 That's right. where? where? 
the choice is ours because God gave us this <laughs> gift, or is it a curse called free will? And it's up to us to choose. Jesus rewards those who have faith in him that can't see him and still love him. There are many watchers, many watchers from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to many others. My dad. Angels are also watching as well. They just happen to be watching while they're on assignment. And they're fascinated by us, by the way. What about those sins that wrap themselves so tightly around our feet and trip us up? Anybody deal with those? Oh, come on. Anybody deal with those? We're all cool. We don't need to be here. I don't know why I'm here. Yeah, we all are dealing with sins that wrap themselves so tightly around our feet and try to trip us up. So what are those sins? Think about those rhetorically in your own mind for you personally. What are those sins? Think about it. Bring them to surface in your mind. Sometimes we know and our conscience can really eat at us. But sometimes we don't realize we are sinning and how badly we are hurting ourselves and possibly others around us, including our bodies. I've heard so many times that I've said myself in the past, doing loads of copious amounts of drugs and alcohol. Hey, I'm not hurting anybody else. I'm not hurting anybody around me. Destroying myself. Bad mentality. Bad character defects developing. And I was hurting others around because I didn't realize how much they loved me. I was hurting them because they were watching me destroy myself. That's for somebody here tonight. This is what the enemy wants. The enemy, Satan, the enemy wants us to be blind to reality and unaware of the sinful life that we're living in. That's what he assigns his demons to do for the unbelievers, just like God assigns angels to the believers and those that he's calling. They have assignment to feed lies into our mind, into our conscience. So I'm going to say that again. This is what the enemy wants. The enemy wants us to be blind to reality. Reality isn't this, by the way. Reality is a lot of things we can't see, okay? To be blind to reality and unaware of the sinful life that we're living in. This is why so many of us have been, or are, are in denial. What the world has told us is okay and good and actually not okay and not good at all. It's a big fat lie. Yeah. The world's way can set us on a very wide course of destruction. But God has a very particular race, a unique plan for each of us, each one of us. It's a life of goodness and peace instead of a life with dependencies, obsessions, and addictions. For many of us, our, our, our past hurts, hang-ups, and habits hold us back, and they trip us up. Many of us are stuck in bitterness over what someone has said or done to us. We continue to hold on to the hurt, and we refuse to forgive the ones who have hurt us. I hope you're listening carefully here. Forgiveness is necessary for healing. Unforgiveness is a cancer that will destroy you from the inside out. You may have been hurt deeply even. Perhaps you were abused as a child, or maybe you were or are in a marriage where your spouse committed adultery. I want you to know that whatever the pain is, I hurt for you. I'm truly sorry for you. Sorry you had to go through that pain. But holding on to that hurt and not being willing to forgive that person who hurt you in the past is allowing them to continue to hurt you today Amen. in the present. And when I can tell you honestly that if you're going through feelings like that, and I've heard for you, uh, you can't imagine how much your maker hurts for you and wants the best for you. Yeah. Working this Christ-centered recovery program will, with God's power, allow you to find the courage and the strength to forgive them or him or her. Now, don't let me get you all stressed out. You don't have to forgive them tonight. But I do want to bring this to surface in your mind if this is for somebody here. It's something to start thinking about and knowing how to properly respond to in God's timing. You don't have to forgive them tonight, but as you travel your road to recovery, God will help you find the willingness to forgive them and be free of their hold on your life. 
Some of you are bound by guilt. You keep beating around, you keep beating yourself up over some past failure. You're trapped and you're stuck in your guilt. You think that no one anywhere is as bad as you are. That no one could love the real you. And that no one could ever forgive you for the terrible things that you've done. Well, that's just not true. God can. God will. That's why Jesus went to the cross out of obedience to his Father. And that's why his Father was willing to give up his only begotten Son. That's how much your Maker loves you. He gave the whole world a chance to be saved. Jesus went to the cross for our sins. He knows everything you've ever done and everything you've ever experienced. And there are many here tonight that have faced similar failures and hurts in their life and have accepted Jesus Christ's forgiveness. They are here to encourage and support you, whoever this message is for. Who's heard of Paul? Who's heard of Paul the Apostle? Paul had a lot of regret about his past. He even participated in and he oversaw the murder of a young man named Stephen because Stephen was a Christian. That's a great name, isn't it, Stephen? Oh, yeah. Yeah. But in Philippians 3.13, Paul tells us, No, dear brothers, I am still not all I should be, but I am bringing all my energies to bear on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. Here's the bottom line. If you want to be free from your hurts, habits, and hang-ups. You need to deal with your past bitterness and guilt once and for all. You need to do as Isaiah 43, 18 tells us. Isaiah 43, 18 tells us, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. That doesn't mean ignore the past. You need to learn from your past. Offer forgiveness. Make amends. And then release it. Let it go. That's what being still and knowing that I'm God is all about, by the way. Somebody heard that lesson recently in Psalm 46.10. And being still means, the Hebrew meaning is, let it go. Let go of it. Be still and let go of everything. That the only way you can do that with peace of mind, with real peace of mind, is knowing who the true one and only higher power is. And hopefully that he lives right here inside of you. Only then can you be free from your guilt, your grudges, and grief. Let's face it, we've all stumbled over a hurt, a hang-up, or a bad habit. But the race isn't over yet. God isn't interested in how we started or how we fell, but he's interested in how we get back up and finish the race. Amen? Yeah. Man is not defined by how he's fallen. It's, it's by how he gets back up. Even if he has to get back up seven times. Fears for the future. Let's talk about fears for the future. We're going a little late. I apologize. You may worry about your future and be afraid to change. We have all worried about things we actually have no control over, nor have the power to change. And you know what? Worrying is a lack of trust in God. That doesn't mean you're a bad person if you worry. I worry too, and God has to remind me every day. <laughs> Trust in me, silly. The truth is we can say without any doubt or fear, the Lord is my helper and I am not afraid of anything that mere man can do to me. Hebrews 13, six. You may have been in your hurt, hang up or wrapped up in your, your habit for so long that it has become your identity. Any of you who recover know what I'm talking about from the past? My drug use, my alcoholism, and my anger was my identity. Ugh. You may be thinking, what will happen if I really give recovery a chance? Will I change? If I give up my old hurts, hang-ups, and habits, what will I become like? Who will I be? Will I forget who I am? It's kind of a scary thought for some people. I know for a reason. Change is not easy, but it's necessary. You may, be, uh, you may have been using alcohol, maybe prescription drugs. Maybe food is an issue. You're afraid of what you will do without your substance of choice. Cigarettes, 
You may have been enabling someone in a dysfunctional relationship for years for codependency. Perhaps you wonder, what if I change and my alcoholic husband gets mad at me? What if I change and my alcoholic wife gets mad at me? What if I'm the alcoholic and I change and my wife gets mad at me? <laughs> because she's not an alcoholic. Okay, there's a little bit of facetious there, but okay. those in the crowd know this is dead serious too, even though we're laughing. Because God's helped us overcome, God has helped us overcome things. <laughs> yes, the Lord can safely change you and you won't lose yourself. He'll help you understand exactly who you really are and can and should be in yourself without all the things of the world weighing you down and tying around your feet and dragging you down. It's a, it's a freedom. It's an institution of freedom. Follow God's rules and live in freedom like you've never experienced before. It sounds like a paradigm. Institution of freedom. It's freedom. God doesn't want you to stay frozen in an unhealthy relationship or a bad habit. He wants you to do your part in becoming healthy. Even if our past was extremely painful, however, we may still resist change and the freedom that can be found in really working this program. I know what that, do you know what that means? I mean, have you seen it yourself or been there before too? So I've been so caught up in a drug habit, alcohol, that uh, we still resist change and freedom that can be found in really working a program, and we stay in that rot and that filth. It's not even returning to mom. It's just wallowing in the mire. Speaking of Jim Morrison. <laughs> Even if our past was extremely painful, we still resist that change. That freedom can be found if you work this program. Because it's Christ-centered. Because all of our fear of the unknown or because of our despair, we just close our minds because we think that we don't deserve any better. As you work the principles in these steps, know and remember. Remember that 1 John 4, 18 says, where God's love is, there is no fear. Because God's perfect love drives out fear. Yeah. You are not here by mistake tonight, none of you. If you're watching on video, you're not watching by mistake. This room is full of changed lives. You've seen it. It touches me deeply. That's why I have Kleenex right here. It's my prayer for each of you that you will not let your past failures or your fear of your future stop you from giving celebrate recovery a real try. I think it's ironic that we are in a day where we are forced to wear masks in public. Anybody see where I'm about to go? Are you wearing a mask of denial tonight? Before you can make any progress in your recovery, you need to face your denial. Now the world and the media doesn't want us to take off those masks to cause bacterial pneumonia. They want us to keep those masks on. But you know what else the spirit of the world wants you to do? Keep a mask of denial on and don't take it off. Wear it at all times to protect yourself. You see what I'm, okay. As, as soon as you remove your mask, your recovery begins or it begins again. It doesn't matter if you're new in recovery or if you've been in recovery, working the steps for years. Denial can rear its ugly head and return at any time. You may trade addictions, or you may get into a new relationship that's unhealthy for you in a different way than the previous one. So this lesson is for all of us. What is denial? Denial has been defined as a false system of beliefs that are not based on reality, and a self-protecting behavior that keeps us from honestly facing the truth. Don't take off that mask, it'll keep you safe. As kids, we, are all, we all learned various coping skills, and they came in handy when we didn't get the attention that we wanted from our parents or others to block out our pain and our fears. Some of us eventually discovered drugs to help us alleviate that pain and escape reality. For a time, those coping systems worked, but as years progressed, they, con they confused and they clouded our view of the truth and our lives. That's exactly what the enemy wants and how he works. As we grew, our perception of ourselves and our expectations of all those around us grew. But because we retrain our childish 
because we retained our childish methods of coping, our perceptions of reality became increasingly and more unrealistic and distorted. Our coping skills grew into denial, and most of our relationships ended up broken or less fulfilling than they could have been. This results in us really only half living. We're only half living, not totally fulfilled in this life. Did you ever deny that your parents had problems? Did you ever deny that you had problems? No. The truth is, we can all answer yes to these questions to some extent, but for some of us, that denial turned into shame and guilt. Denial is like that huge elephant that sits in the middle of the, the room. No one in the family wants to talk about it or acknowledge it in any way. Let's try something. Do any of, the, any of these following comments sound familiar to you? Vaguely familiar? Or something like it? Can we please stop talking about it? Talking only makes it worse. <laughs> Look, if we don't talk about it, it'll go away. Babe, let's pretend that it didn't really happen. <laughs> if I tell her that it hurts me when she says that, I'm afraid that she will leave me. If I tell him it hurts me when he says that, I'm afraid he will leave me. He really doesn't drink that much. It really doesn't hurt when he does that. I'm fine. But he drinks more than I do. She's been married three times. I've only been married twice. <laughs> I eat because you make me so mad. If you didn't nag me all the time, I wouldn't. <sighs> Look, honey, I have a tough job and I work hard. I need a few drinks to relax. It doesn't mean that I have a problem. <laughs> Get out of my way. <laughs> of the refrigerator. <laughs> As I said earlier, before we can take the first step of our recovery, we must first face and admit our denials. God says in Jeremiah 6.14, you can't heal a wound by saying it's not there. It'll just fester, I promise. The effects of denial, let's talk about that. Let's look at tonight's acrostic. You have your notes? Yes. <clears throat> yes, and I've been waiting to use them. <laughs> okay, so we're looking at the acrostic of denial, right? D stands for disables our feelings. I'm glad you're writing these down, Sue. Oh, yeah. I memorized it. I'm taking it. I love this guy. He's like a little brother to me. Don't worry about it. E stands for energy lost. N stands for negates growth. I isolates us from God. These are all things denial does. A alienates us from our relationships. And finally, L lengthens the pain. I'll cover them again in a second, so I'm not, I'm not going to leave you in the dust here. Don't worry about it. So let's go. Let's talk about D. The D in denial stands for disables our feelings. Hiding our feelings and living in denial freezes our emotions, and it binds us. Understanding and feeling our feelings is where we find freedom. Understanding and feeling our feelings is the true path to freedom. Who's experienced really feeling their feelings for the first time after being loaded for a long time? Me too. <laughs> And you know what? Just because you don't run to drugs or alcohol to get numbed up, it doesn't make it easier. In fact, in a lot of ways, it's harder when you're used to escaping and numbing like that for years, and that's how you solve, solve your problems. But now that you're ready to really solve your problems, or actually just work through them and let the Lord solve your problems. For example, losing my dad, and then losing Jed, this mentor, and Roger, a Sunday school teacher that I work with, and many others. Gene, Pastor Gene. A uh, CR pastor that was my mentor just recently passed away unexpectedly. Don't on call me. <laughs> <laughs> so, disables our feelings. Denial can disable our feelings. Really feeling your feelings and experiencing those hardships and just facing them. That's the way to go. That's the way to be a man. 
That's the way to be a woman. Feel it. Let the hurt hurt. Face the pain. Don't run from it. Don't numb up. Hiding our feelings and living in denial freezes our emotions and it binds us. So you're going to really find freedom when you feel those feelings. 2 Peter 2.19 tells us this. 2 Peter 2.19. They promise them freedom while they themselves are slaves of destructive habits. For we are slaves of anything that has conquered us. For me, the basic test of freedom is not what I'm free to do, but it's what I'm free not to do. I'm free not to snort that line. We find freedom to feel our true feelings when we find Christ and we step out of denial. So the next letter in, in denial is E, which stands for energy lost. Energy lost. A major side effect of denial is anxiety. Anxiety causes us to waste precious energy dealing with past hurts and failures and the fear of the future. As you go through this program, you will learn that it is only in the, the present that positive change can occur. <coughs> Worrying about the past and dreading the future make us unable to live and enjoy God's plans for us in this present moment. We let our fears and our worries paralyze us, but the only lasting way that we can be free from them is by giving them to God. Giving them to God. How do we do that? Psalm 146.7 says, He frees the prisoners. He lifts the burdens from those bent down beneath their loads. I'll tell you an example of how I've given those things to God. I uh, um, visualize things. And I'm doing devotions and I'm praying in the morning. And an epiphany, maybe it was the Holy Spirit just saying, I'll, I'll, I'll show you and help you understand how to let these things go. That's kind of how I felt. And I was on my knees praying. And I stopped and I looked up and I had tears down my face. And I was really distraught and, and just uh, beat down. I hadn't seen my kids for a long time. I was divorced and didn't want to be divorced. I was lonely. Jobs weren't working out like they wanted to be. And uh, struggling in a relationship, a broken relationship with my sister. And I was just depressed. And I had all these problems that were weighing me down like this. And I couldn't let them go. They were, I was constantly sad and depressed. And he gave me a picture of a hill to walk up, um, maybe about a 100, 200 yards, the hill. And at the top was a huge tree. And underneath this tree, waiting for me at the top of the hill, was Jesus, just by himself, standing there. It was a very realistic picture. It's like I it was given a vision. And I had with me these burdens uh, were in the form of bowls. And I was carrying these bowls up the hill. And I knelt down to them, and I had these bowls of broken relationships, addiction, loneliness, anger, betrayal. Lots of pain, suicidal thoughts. And I started weeping. I could see Jesus there. And I said, Lord, I need you to take these from me. I really need you to take these from me. They're weighing me down. I don't know what to do with them. And I picked, I could see him reaching down with a gentle smile on his face. And he just took them from me. He says, you're going to be okay. I've got this. And he turned around and walked the other way, and I came back down the hill, and I felt free. Visualization and imagining things is a good way to let things go, and then start thinking about how you just release those in your mind, and your heart, and your spirit to the Lord, as the Holy Spirit's working on this inside of you. He wants to take your burdens. You just gotta wanna give them to Him. It'll change your life, and it will really, really free you up. If you will transfer the energy required to maintain your denial into learning God's truth, a healthy love for others and yourself will occur. As you depend more and more on your higher power, Jesus Christ, you will see the light of truth and reality. Let's move on to the end in denial. Deny, denial negates growth. Negates growth. We are as sick as our secrets. And again, we cannot grow in recovery until we are ready to step out of our denial into the truth. God is waiting to take your hand and bring you out. The Bible says, They cried to the Lord in their troubles, and He rescued them. He led them from the darkness and the shadow of death, and He snapped their chains. Psalm 107, 13-14 As you travel the road of your recovery, you will come to understand that God never wastes a hurt. He never wastes a moment. God will never waste your darkness. 
but he can't use it unless you step out of your denial into the light of his truth. You've got to cross over. Denial also isolates us, isolates us from God. I isolates us. Adam and Eve are a great example of how secrets and denial separate us from true, true fellowship with God. After they sinned, their secrets separated them from God. Genesis 3, 7 tells us that Adam and Eve hid from God because they felt naked and ashamed. Of course, Adam tried to rationalize. He said to God, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from that tree. <laughs> blame. Genesis 3, 12. And then uh, first he tried to blame God, you know, by saying, the woman you put here with me. Then he tried to blame it on Eve. She gave me some fruit. Remember, God's light shines on the truth, and our denial keeps us in the dark. 1 John 1, 5 through 7. I might want to write that down. 1 John 1, 5 through 7, it says, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie, and we do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Our denial, our denial not only isolates us from God, it alienates us from our relationships. <clears throat> Isolation and alienation are a terrible thing, and it drives more loneliness, by the way. Ask a guy how he knows. This, is the, this part is important. This is the important part, gang. Listen carefully. Denial tells us we are getting away with it. We think no one knows, but they do. But while denial may shield us from the hurt, it also helps us, it keeps us from helping others or the people that we love the most. We don't dare reveal our true selves to others for fear of what they will think or say if they knew the real us. We must protect ourselves, our secrets, at any cost. So we isolate ourselves, and we thereby minimize the risk of exposure and possible rejection from others. But at what price? The eventual loss of all our important relationships. That's a big price. What's the answer? Listen to Ephesians 4.25. It says, stop lying to each other. Tell the truth, for we are parts of each other, and when we lie to each other, we are hurting ourselves. Me and a group of friends I grew up with since high school continued a bad life all into our 40s because we kept meeting up with each other and encouraging each other that we're all cool. And we we're all lying to each other. And we all knew better, too. Some of those friends don't want anything to do with me anymore. I've lost a couple of close friends. Remember, it's always better to tell the ugly truth than a beautiful lie. Finally, denial lengthens pain. We have the false belief that denial protects us from our pain. In reality, denial allows our pain to fester and grow and to turn into shame and guilt. Denial extends your hurt. It multiplies your problems. Truth, like surgery, hurts for a while, but it cures, it heals. God promises us in Jeremiah 30, 17, Jeremiah 30, 17, I will give you back your health again, and I will heal your wounds. Yeah. Let's wrap this up. It's taken a long time. I apologize. Tonight, I encourage you to step out of your denial. This message is for somebody tonight specifically. I encourage you to step out of your denial. Walking out of your denial is not easy. And taking off that mask is hard. Everything about you shouts, don't do it. It's not safe, but it is safe. It's safe at Celebrate Recovery. It's, a, it's safe here. Here you have people who care about you and who love you for who you are. People who will stand beside you as truth becomes a way of life. Jesus tells us, know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Step out of your denial so you can step into Jesus' unconditional love and grace, and begin your healing journey of recovery, and walk in peace. Grace and peace be to all of you. Let me pray for all of you. Can you stand, please? And then Ryan, you want to come up and close this out with this serenity prayer? 
Father God, thank you very much for being with us tonight. I thank you for the time we get to celebrate everybody that completed their 12-step study. I hope this lesson, Lord, speaks to some hearts and minds and you'll give some of us plenty to think about when we go home tonight and meditate on. Bless us now as we go into open share. Bless the time that the ladies have together in privacy and the same with the men as they share and be with us during that time as well, Lord. We thank you very much. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.